Hello, this is Jonathan Engelsma, and in this lecture we're going to build upon what we learned about Swift in the last lecture. In particular, we're going to look at closures, tuples, optionals, and the various uh, alternatives we have for creating objects, as well as protocols. First, closures. Closures are self-contained blocks of functionality that can be passed around and used in your code. In other words, we can bundle up code and treat it like data, pass it around just like we would a uh, reference to data. Now if you're familiar with Objective-C or other languages that sport closures, closures in Swift are analogous to blocks in Objective-C or Lambdas in other programming languages. An interesting thing about closures is that they can capture and store references to any constants or variables that are defined um, within the current scope. So it captures the context in which they are created and that travels along with the closure when we pass it as a method parameter or in other ways. So this term is, is known as closing and, and hence the terminology closure. So closures take three forms in Swift. Global functions and these are closures that have a name but don't capture any values. There's nested functions, and those are closures that have a name and are defined within a function, so they capture values from in, within their enclosing functions. And then finally, we have closure expressions in Swift, and these are unnamed closures, so they don't have a name. They're anonymous, if you will, and they're written in a lightweight, convenient syntax, and as we mentioned before, they capture the values um, that are defined within their surrounding context. So closure expressions um, are a way to write inline closures in our code in a really brief, um, you could say terse, but focused syntax. And there's a number of interesting syntactical optimizations provided for writing closures. And we can do this, use these optimizations, and, and still retain the clarity in our code so the intent is still very um, clear. So these optimizations are in particular um, parameter and return value type inferencing, implicit returns from single expression closures, there's shorthand for argument names, and there's also a trailing closure syntax. Let's look at um, each of these. First, um, in general, when we define a closure expression, it's going to take the form that you see on the screen. So it always opens with a, uh, a left curly brace, then we have a list, a comma, delimited list of parameters just like we would in a function or a method in parentheses followed by the arrow or the minus greater than operator and then following that will be the return type then the keyword in and then a list of one or more statements so here's a simple example I have an array of strings called students and it's a constant array and I can call the map function which is defined by the array class and what the map function does is it takes a closure as input and then it applies the code in that closure to every element within that array so in this case you can see that when I call students.map the closure I'm responding or the closure I'm sending has a single parameter um, student which is of type string and that's matching the type of the array and it's also going to return a string and in this case it's using interpolation so I've got a single statement that forms the string student where student is replaced with the ith element of the array is getting swifter so map essentially produces a copy of the array but it mutates it in some way based on whatever code I give it in the closure expression. So that's a full-blown invocation of map showing the closure expression in full glory but we can simplify our closure expressions as well. For example, um, Swift is very intelligent when it comes to type inferencing. We've seen that in our previous lecture and so Swift knows in this case that, that students is a string array. So we can write it 
as you see in the second example here on the screen. So we can, in other words, get rid of the explicit typing on that parameter. Instead, in the closure syntax, we simply say student in and then we put that um, line of code. Now, if we wanted to go even further, we can use what are called shorthand arguments. And in this case, we can reference those arguments using $0, $1, and so forth. Since there's only one argument in this particular uh, closure expression, we know that it's going to be $0. So we start with, with 0. So that third example here does exactly the same as the other two. It's just even more terse. We can go yet further. If a closure is passed as the last argument of function, then um, it can appear outside of the parentheses. So in this case, you see us calling students.map, and then since, there's, since the closure expression is the last argument of the function, I can just put it in curly braces right after the function invocation call. And then finally, if there's no parameters other than the closure itself, we can get rid of the parentheses even. So here in the bottom of the screen you see the the most terse example of this exact same uh, invocation of map with a closure. In this case we just say students.map, there's no parentheses because there's there's no params other than the closure and then the closure itself using the shorthand argument expression. So this very last example is the exact same as the original um, closure example that we put up there. Now closures come up over and over again in the iOS framework and, and we'll see that in the lectures to come. So this is a very important construct and it, the syntax is something you'll want to get familiar with as soon as possible. Let's move on and look at tuples in Swift. A tuple is a lightweight custom ordered collection of multiple values and tuples are brand new in Swift. They really don't have their analog or a comparative construct uh, back in Objective-C. So here you see a very simple example. I define a coordinate and its type is int comma int and I put it in parentheses. What I'm doing here is I'm defining a tuple type. In this case a tuple consisting of two integers. In the second example I'm defining a variable called location and you can see this tuple consists of three different types a string, a float, and a float. And so I also show initialization of this tuple so I can initialize it and I simply put the values in parentheses just as you see. So this might represent a location um, in this case of our campus here at Grand Valley. Now what would we use tuples for? It turns out there's a number of interesting ways we can use tuples. Uh, for one thing, we can use them to assign multiple values simultaneously. So in this code example, I've got two variables, one of type int, one of type string, and I could do an assignment to these two different variable definitions in the same, same statement of Swift code by simply using tuples. So you'll see in the, the third line that I say sum int comma sum string in parentheses equals the integer literal 10 and the string hello. So that, in effect, assigns those two variables, those values respectively, in a single line of code. And if I were to run this, you'd see the uh, print line would confirm um, that that assignment did indeed happen. Another usage we can use tuples for, in fact, we saw this in the last lecture when we talked about functions, we can use tuples for returning multiple return values from a function. And so just as review, here's a function that takes four integers and returns a tuple consisting of two integers. And you can see by the expression when I do my return I simply put the values in parentheses and separate them by commas. And so in this fashion we can have functions that return multiple values instead of the single value that we're so used to in many other languages. We can also use tuples for doing swaps in two variables. So here I have a string variable alpha and a string variable omega and each one is assigned the strings first and last respectively and then you can see in the assignment statement on the bottom that omega comma alpha equals alpha comma omega and so what we're doing in essence there 
is swapping those two values. Now incidentally, Swift also has a global function called swap, which would be another way to do this. But I thought I would just show you, you can use tuples to swap two variables. Now, you might be wondering, how do you ex access values that are within a variable typed as a tuple? So here's an example. There's actually several different alternative ways to do this. So I've set the location variable here to a string float float. And the first e example uses what we call the underscore notation. And in this case, I'm only interested in getting the description out of this location. So I can define a variable description, and if I put it in a tuple, and I use the underscores as shown, what the underscores are saying here is I don't care about the other two values, just assign the variable description. And so this defines a string um, description, and the assignment statement will actually put the string Grand Rapids, or assign the string Grand Rapids to description. An alternative way to extract this information is to use index literals. So I can say something like, if location is my tuple, and I want the very first element in it, I can say location dot zero. And in this case, the variable descript2 is going to have the string Grand Rapids assigned to it. And then finally, a third alternative, and perhaps a very attractive one in terms of making your code readable, is to use names on the tuple elements. So here I've defined my favorite location variable and notice how I've given each member of the tuple a name. So I've said name colon, nuego, latitude colon, and then a float, long colon, and then a float. And if I create or define the tuple in this fashion, then I can simply dereference using those names. So here I say fave location dot name and that would print out the string nuego. Now, you might be wondering when you have been hearing me speak about tuples, you might have drawn the uh, conclusion that, boy, this tuple syntax looks a lot like function parameter lists that we saw in the previous lecture. And this is not an, exam this is not an accident. Um, you can pass a tuple um, as an argument to its parameter. So these tuples are essentially the exact same thing. I, or I should say function parameter lists are, in fact, tuples. And to demonstrate that, take a look at this fragment of code. So I've got a function max that takes two integers and returns an int, and as you might be guessing, it determines the max between those two input parameters. And so here I say uh, let the constant vals equals 10 and 20, a tuple respectively, and note it's two integers. So I could simply call the function max and pass that tuple, and everything's good. It magically understands that that tuple forms the parameter list for that particular function. Next topic, let's look at optionals in Swift. Now conceptually when you think about optionals, you can think of it as a box that potentially wraps an object of any type. Now it's important to realize an optional might wrap an object when we encounter them in Swift, or they might not. So in other words, an optional is a box, and the box may or may not have a object within it, hence the name optional. Let's take a look at how these work. First of all, we can create an optional using the syntax that you see here. So I've defined a variable might be a string, and I've simply called the option initializer and given it the string boo. And if I did a print line here, it would actually print out that this was an optional. It would not print out a string. The second definition here, um, I define might be a string too. And notice a slightly different syntax. And this is probably the more standard way you'll see this done in Swift. So I say might be a string too, colon, string is the type, but I put a question mark right after it to designate that this is actually an optional that contains a string, or it's, I'm defining a box here. And in this case, I'm assigning the string boo to that, so the box or the optional does have a string in it. The important point to note here is that these two variables are not strings. They are of type optional. Assigning this wrap type to an optional variable causes it um, 
to automatically get wrapped. So the string boo here that I'm assigning in the second example or the string boo exclamation mark that I'm sending as a parameter to the initializer, those are the native type that I'm actually, or the original, the wrapped type, uh, more properly said, that I'm wrapping. And so when I do an assignment of the wrapped type to an optional to a variable typed optional it actually automatically wraps it and sticks it in the box now optionals can be passed to functions when they're expected and the syntax here is very similar so I've defined a function in this example called give me an optional and the parameter name here is s but notice the type so I say colon string question mark so what I'm saying is this function takes an optional that may or may not wrap a string. So then I can define an optional variable poof, so in this case it's a constant, and once again I use the string question mark and I assign it kapoof, and we know from what we just learned previously that the string kapoof here is going to get wrapped into the optional and assigned to the variable poof. So poof now um, is an optional containing a string. And when I call, give me an optional, now I can pass that along and everything's good. Now if I were to call this function with the wrap type, in other words if I were just to call it with a string type, either variable or a literal as I've shown here, then in this case the literal cheese will get wrapped as an optional. So once I get within the context of that function, the input parameter s would be in fact an optional. Now note that you cannot pass an optional type where the wrapped type is expected. So if I have a function here that's expecting a string, I cannot pass it, as I've shown you here, an optional wrapping a string. We must unwrap an optional before using it in this case. So how do we do that? How do we unwrap optionals in Sw Swift? One way to unwrap an optional is using what we call the forced unwrapped operator, which is simply a postfix exclamation mark. So in this example you see a variable no problemo and it's of type string question mark so it's an optional and in this case it's wrapping the string behaving nicely. Then when I call the function give me a string please it's expecting a string not an optional. So I can use the postfix um, exclamation mark as you see there so I've got no problemo in the in the function invocation with a exclamation mark behind it and what that does is the exclamation mark operator simply unwraps that optional and passes the function um, passes to the function the string uh, that it that is contained here in this situation it's behaving nicely is actually the input parameter within the function now Notice that we cannot send a message to a wrapped object before it is unwrapped. So here I have a variable might be valid, which is an optional wrapping a string, and I've assigned it the value howdy. And then in the very next line, I say might be valid dot uppercase string. Now this is a method that computes an uppercase version of whatever string I'm calling it on. But might be valid is not a string here it's an optional containing a string. So the compiler would flag this invocation as an error. However, applying what we've learned in the previous slide, we could apply the forced unwrap operator, the postfix exclamation mark, as you see in the last example on the screen. So I say might be valid exclamation mark dot uppercase string. What that's saying is take this optional containing a string and unwrap it and on the resulting string object call the uppercase string method. So this second example will work just fine. Swift also provides another way of using an optional where the wrapped type um, is expected. So these are implicitly unwrapped optionals. So in this example I've got a function give me a nice string that expects a string value and then I've defined here an implicitly unwrapped optional. So might be nice is the variable name. And the syntax for the type is string exclamation mark. That is an implicitly unwrapped optional. And what we're telling the compiler here is 
if we ever pass this particular variable, might be nice, or reference it in a situation where the unwrapped type is expected, then go ahead and implicitly unwrap it. So in this situation, um, might be nice gets unwrapped automatically and passed as a string to the function, give me a nice string. Now, one of the things we're going to want to be able to do is to determine whether or not an optional contains a wrapped value or if it's empty. In other words, is the box empty or does it have an object? So to test if an optional contains a wrapped value, you can simply compare it to the value nil in Swift. And so in the very first if statement, you can see that I've assigned a optional containing a string, might be nil, and I can simply say in an if statement, if might be nil is equal to nil, that means it's empty. Now, to specify that an optional contains no wrapped value, we can also assign, or if it's a method parameter, pass a nil. So in the second part of the example underneath, you see me assigning might be nil to the value nil, and in this case, it will be nil. And so in this code fragment, that second if statement's body gets executed, but not the first. A few other things to be aware of when you're working with optionals. First of all, when you define an optional, it's going to get set to nil automatically. Another thing to be aware of is you cannot wrap an optional that doesn't contain anything. So if you've got an optional that equates to nil, and you try to unwrap it, and there's no value there, it's actually going to crash your program. So if you're explicitly unwrapping an optional, you need to make sure that that optional is not nil. Now Swift also has syntax for conditionally unwrapping an optional. So if we don't know whether or not something has an object, an option has an object or not, that it's wrapping, we can use this conditional syntax. So the first example here would be problematic. So in this case, I define an optional might not be valid that wraps a string. And notice how I've given it um, a type string question mark. So it is, in fact, an optional wrapping a string. But I assign it to the value nil, which basically says it's an empty box. There's nothing being wrapped here. Then if I use the um, exclamation mark here to force the unwrap and call uppercase, my program is going to crash. This is a problem. Now, if I look at the second example, I've got a slightly different syntax. Instead of the exclamation mark when I reference the variable might not be valid, I use a question mark. And what this does is a conditional unwrap. If might not be valid in fact contained something, then it would go ahead and continue executing uppercase string. On the other hand, if it does not contain anything, then it simply skips executing that method call. We can also use optionals in comparisons whenever the wrapped value is used. So in this case, the unwrapping does happen implicitly. And if there's no wrapped value in the optional, the comparison is false. So here I've defined a value to be a optional wrapping a string, which I've set to Amos. And in the if statement, you see, I simply say, if a value is equal to Amos, in this case, it unwraps the a value optional and does the comparison string against string. And in this case, it's actually going to print. And then similarly, in our next example, we've wrapped an integer um, in a variable called a number and assigned it to one. And when we do the comparison, if a number is less than 100, it in fact is going to um, print that it is less. So the unwrap happens implicitly in this case. So why do we have optionals? Or why should we care about these? Well, it has to do with the legacy Objective-C uh, frameworks that Swift has been designed to seamlessly integrate with. So it provides us an interchange um, mechanism for object values when we're calling um, methods on these Objective-C frameworks or getting return values back. So we need a way to send and receive nil when we're dealing with these underlying Objective-C frameworks. And all of the objects 
in from an objective C perspective are actually handled as optionals in Swift. Now there is still some flux in Swift in in the wrappers on those legacy Objective C frameworks. Um, so are there there are situations where things are wrapped that should not be, and vice versa. And those are still being updated. So you might occasionally run into um, some problems in that situation, uh, but hopefully those will be addressed uh, by Apple soon. Let's move on now and talk about objects in Swift. Now there are three different flavors of objects in Swift, enums, structs, and classes. And all three of these are objects in Swift. That might seem odd if you know other languages that use these constructs because they're usually different or treated differently in other languages. But in Swift, all three of these are lo uh, objects um, and, and have different, uh, different types of um, functionality or, or bring different things to the table. So all of these are going to be defined with a keyword, either enum, struct, or class, respectively. And that's followed by a class or an object um, name. So this is the type name. And normally we will use camel case. So the first, the convention is the first letter will be capitalized um, for every word in that type. And then we'll actually have the implementation of that class struct or enum following in curly braces. Now these definitions can appear anywhere within the file, within an object, or even within a function. And the scope is determined by where that declaration happens to be made. Now all three of these can have initializers. These are also known as constructors in other languages. They can have properties, which are variables declared at the top level of the object. And these can be associated with either the object, so they're instance variables, or the class, um, class variables. We can also have methods on all three of these constructs. And these are simply functions that are declared at the top level of the object. And once again, they can be associated with the object or instance methods or class methods. So let's take the enum first. An enum is an object type whose uh, where the instances represent distinct predefined alternative values. So for example, if you need a set of constants to serve as a set of alternative values for a particular variable, we would use an enum for this. So in my example, I have an enum called b-type. And there's three different alternatives in this case, queen, worker, and drone. And I can define a, very, a constant of type b-type, as you see here. I say let my b equals, and then I can dereference the value on the type. So I can say pdype.queen. So my b is now um, set to have type b type and its actual value is queen. Now a handy shortcut is if we know the type of the variable. So in this definition, I say let another b colon b type. So I'm saying another b is a variable of type b type. And in that case, I know the type already. And so instead of saying b type dot worker, I can simply say dot worker. And I can do the same thing when I'm calling a function. In the third example here, we have a function called examine b, and it's expecting a type b type. And so when I call it, since it knows the parameter type, I can use the dot syntax. So in this case, I'm calling it with a value drone or dot drone. So enums can actually be typed to specific types. Like I could say the enum is going to be an int or a string, etc. They can have initializers, methods, and properties, as we've already seen. And by default, enums are going to be implemented as ints. And their default values are assigned starting with zero. So in that B type that we just had up there, um, the, the queen, the first one would be zero. And as each of those cases appear, that number would simply increment. So an enum is a value type. That is, um, if you assign an enum for, to a variable or you pass it as a function, it's passed by value. Or in other words, a copy is made of that value and sent to the function or assigned to the variable. It is not passed or assigned by reference. So here's an example of an enum being defined with fixed values. So here I've defined an enum type fancy b type, and I've said this is going to be implemented as a string. Then what I do is that when I have each of the case cases for the different alternatives, I explicitly sign them a value. 
In this case, you can see the strings queen, worker, and drone for each of the alternatives, respectively. And we can access that value by calling the raw value property. So here I define a constant fancy b of type fancy b type, and I set it to queen. And if I print line on fancy b dot raw value, it's actually going to print out the string queen because that's its fixed value. Structs are object types in Swift as well. And you can think of these as kind of a knocked down version of class or class light. They sit in between um, enums and class in terms of capability. Now one of the things that classes have that structs don't is the ability to express inheritance. So we can define one class in terms of another and we lose that functionality. We do not have that in structs. So here I've defined a struct of type B and I've set two instance variables, type and age. Type is basically an enum as we defined on the previous screen, age is an int. And then I've defined an initializer that allows um, client code to set up one of these B objects passing in their two values. I've also defined a function description which returns a string using interpolation on those property values. So the syntax for creating a new object of type B here is to simply um, call the initializer by using the uh, struct name B and then putting in parentheses the parameters of that initializer. So here I'm, I'm setting the type to worker and the age to 14 and if I were to call printline by calling the description method you would see that it would say something like this B is a worker of age 14 days old. So nearly all of Swift's built-in object types are actually structs. So when you're working with ints and strings and arrays and many other things, they are actually structs. So we've seen that structors have initializers, properties, and methods. And um, that's actually a typo here on the slide. It should say a struct is a value type. That is, it's assigned, uh, if it's assigned to a variable or passed to a function, once again, a copy is sent. It is not sent by reference. And once again, that's the same as the enum, but classes actually differ. When we pass objects of type class, they will get passed by reference, as we will soon see. So here's an uh, example of a class. And I've set my class name to be employee, and I've got three string properties on it. And you'll notice a couple of different initializers here. The second one takes all of the parameters needed to create the object. And this is what we refer to as the designated initializer. And the first initializer that appears here is tagged with the keyword convenience. And it's just like it sounds. It's a method or it's an initializer created for the convenience of the client code. In this case, I want to make it possible to create a new employee object without supplying a bio. In other words, I'm going to give a default bio if you call that. And when we implement these convenience initializers, we usually delegate or call the designated initializer. And so here you see me calling self.init. So when we're in a method um, on a class, the self reference points to the current object instance. So if you're familiar with Java, it would be equivalent, self is equivalent to the this um, reference. Here I've also got a method defined um, where we actually compute the pay of the employee based on how long their biography is. And so down below you see syntax for calling or creating objects using each of those construct or initializers respectively. So the variable Steve is initialized by calling that convenience constructor and the variable Tim here is called by calling or created by calling the designated initializer and we'll show some examples uh, momentarily on, on classes but classes are a reference type that is these things get handled as references when we make assignments or we pass them as functions
And furthermore, a class can be set up to inherit the properties or behavior of a parent class. So we have object-oriented inheritance that can be used when we define classes. That's something we lose when we use structs. And a class instance um, is mutable in place. For example, I could set up a reference, a constant reference to an object, and I can't change the constants the constant uh, reference here is to the object reference itself, but I could call properties and mutate um, the guts of that object. So the idea of constant here means the variable referencing the object itself can't change, but we can change things on the object. Now before we do a, a coding example here, let's talk about one more concept protocols in Swift. So protocol provides us with the ability to define similarities between unrelated objects. So sometimes when we're modeling something in code, we have situations where two entities are very similar in terms of um, how we interact with them, but conceptually they're really not the same type of thing and we don't want to use object-oriented inheritance to model those similarities. Instead what we can do is create a protocol. Now protocols are analogous to interfaces in Java or um, abstract interfaces in C++. So all they do is let us define interface without implementation and then it, it's like setting up a contract where we say here is the protocol or the interface and then we can set up classes to actually um, implement those interfaces. So in this example I've got a protocol called broken thing. So I might observe in the domain I'm modeling there's a variety of things that can be broken and there isn't any other type of commonality between these other than they can be broken. They're not really related to each other. So I might have an airplane that I'm modeling and I could say that could be broken and it will provide its own implementation of the crash function here defined by the protocol. And I could have a piece of software or a program that is also broken. And notice programs and airplanes might be completely different, so it makes no sense to inherit from the same base class. But since they both crash, it may make sense to have them implement the same protocol. So in this case, too, function uh, crash on program implements different behavior than what the airplane one does. So these are uh, protocols and as I mentioned they're equivalent to abstract methods in C++ or interfaces in Java and one of the things to note here syntactically is that a class can um, subclass another class as well as implement one or more additional protocols. However syntactically when we're defining such a situation in Swift, the parent class always has to be listed first after that colon. So we'll have class space class name colon and then the very first thing we put there will be that single parent class and then following that we can put a comma delimited list of zero or more protocol names. So a class can implement multiple protocols and uh, zero or more protocols, but a class can only subclass one other class. So we have single inheritance in Swift. All right, to bring all these concepts together, what I'd like to do is, is write a simple program in Swift um, using a number of these concepts that, that we have been talking about. So we'll build a simple rocket ship model and we'll demonstrate inheritance hierarchies will demonstrate closures as well as protocols. Okay, let's bring these concepts home by implementing our first complete Swift program. So I'm in Xcode here and I'm going to create myself a new project. And at this point in time I don't want to worry about anything GUI. I just want to make a command line program to demonstrate some of these Swift language features. So instead of iOS, this is one of the rare times I'm going to go down here and uh, create an OS 10 application. So if I select application here, one of the options I have is the command line tool option. So I'm going to select that and click next and I'll call this my rocket ship uh, demo and I'll go ahead and tuck this away on my um, 
disk here. So we'll put it right here under lecture three. All right, so what I've got here is a standalone program and it just outputs to the command line. So if we look in main.swift, you'll see I've got the obligatory hello world program. Um, and if I run this, you'll see it's simply gonna deposit the string hello world down there on my console. Well, what I wanna do is demonstrate to you the concept of classes. And I wanna create myself a inheritance class hierarchy. And I wanna demonstrate closures as, as well as, as protocols. So we're gonna kinda of wrap this all up into a single demo. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna create rockets. I wanna model rockets in Swift. And so I'm gonna create myself a class um, called rocket that I'll use to model a rocket and then I'll do an extension from that. So I'm gonna create a new file here and this is going to be a Swift file and I'll simply call it rocket with a capital R and this is the file where I'm gonna put this class definition as well as its implementation. So I'll say something like class um, rocket and at the moment this is not going to implement or extend anything. I will add a single property on my rocket class, so I'll give it a fuel tank, which I'll model as a int. And now that I've got a property defined, I probably want to have um, an initializer as well. So I'm just going to um, add myself an initializer here and uh, I'll initialize this thing with fuel, so I can say something like this. We'll init, and the parameter name is fuel, and that's of type int, and I'll say self dot uh, fuel tank equals the parameter that I'm getting in. So there's my initializer. And uh, the other thing I'm gonna do is, is put a function, or a method, on this rocket class to define the behavior, blast off behavior, so I'll say, uh, function uh, blast off and takes no parameters and returns no parameters and it simply goes into a loop here and uh, does the countdown. So we'll start at 10 and as long as i is greater than 0 um, we'll continue and then I'm going to decrement and we'll simply print out the countdown like that and then once we've counted down we can now blast off so I'll just print out this string and so after it counts down it's going to blast off and so there's a very very simple uh, rocket and now I want to add some code in my main program to instantiate an instance of this rocket and to actually um, cause it to blast off. So that's quite easy. So let's go back to our main code here. Um, and in main, um, sorry, in main, we're going to get rid of this hello world. And we're going to add some code to blast off. Now notice I don't have to worry about importing this. It's all in the same project so it knows where everything is. I simply define myself an instance variable of type rocket. So I'll say var rocket and I'll type that to be of type rocket, my class, and I can call the initializer passing in the fuel, and I'll give it a value of 1000, and now to actually uh, cause the rocket to black off, blast off, I simply call the method that I defined. So that's it, and if I run this, you'll see down in the lower um, right, in my debug output, you can see the countdown followed by the blast off. So that's great. One of the things I can do is I can run this in the debugger. So we mentioned this, so let's just show it in action. Let's just say we want to break point right before we do this, uh, or maybe we'll do it in the loop. So if I go down to 21 here, I'll add a, a, a break point. And uh, if we run now, when we get to that statement, we actually trap, and now I'm in the debugger. I can actually examine variables, so I could say, uh, print i and it tells me i is a value of 10. I can type in next to step to the next line and if you don't like to work with the GDB command interface up here in the middle of the screen you can see different buttons and these are all wired to those same commands so here's step over 
for example. Step into, which I don't want to do because I don't have the source code. Step out would actually put me right back in main. And uh, continue would actually execute, but I've got this breakpoint here. So if I get this rid of this breakpoint and say continue, now it actually terminates. All right, so that's the, uh, the debugger. Um, next, what I want to do here is I want to add um, a new uh, type of um, method here, a programmable blastoff method that will actually be able to um, vary its um, behavior based on uh, a closure. So let's go back into the rocket class definition and let's add ourselves a new method here. We'll call the method uh, func programmable blast off and it takes a a single function or closure expression um, and we'll, we'll name this the instruction so we're going to call this function and give it some explicit instructions on how to actually take off and the function that's going to be passed here takes an int as input and returns void or nothing. And the actual body of this function just turns around and calls the instructions that were passed in and passes along that fuel tank uh, instance variable. So that is the um, method itself. And now what I want to do is, is go out to my main uh, program and call that. And instead of passing it a, a function, I'm just going to use a um, closure expression. So to do this, I'm going to implement a more interesting form of black off, uh, blast off. I'm going to find an array here, um, and I'll call this my countdown string. And uh, it's going to be a, a string array. And we'll set it to uh, countdown in, in another language, just for fun here. All right, so there's my countdown string. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, send or call this method, the programmable blast off, and send in an ex uh, closure expression. So I'll say um, rocket dot programmable blast off. And now I need to send it instructions. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my uh, closure um, expression here. I'm going to pass an int. Sorry. And the actual code is going to go in a loop. And notice how we're going to close on this value. So later when this actually gets executed, that array that we're referencing here will be closed in upon so that reference will be captured and it will work very well. Okay, and I got my, oops, this should be in, sorry. And we need a close parent. Okay, so this um, is an example of sending a simple um, closure expression to a method. So let's go ahead and run this. And sure enough, you can see that now we're doing the blast off once again, only we're using the programmatable, programmatic uh, method. Let's try one more thing here. Let's add a protocol um, to the mix. So we're going to define a protocol here. And let's say we want some of our rocket ships to be able be capable of self-destructing. So we're going to define a protocol. And I'll call it my self-destructible airship. And it is a protocol, so we simply define a method called self-destruct. <clears throat> 
and it takes nothing and returns nothing. Now, if we want our rocket to implement this particular protocol, then I need to put colon self-destructible airship. And as soon as I do that, um, I now need to add um, the method. So I'm just going to copy this method. And I need to add that method and implement it. And to implement it, we'll just put a simple print line here so we know um, it executed. And when we call this out in main, we can say rocket.selfdestruct. And if we call this, sure enough, it blasts off and then it uh, self-destructs by calling that method. Now let's look at one more thing before we wrap this demo up. Let's take a look at creating a derived class to this particular uh, rocket base class. So we're going to add a new type of rocket and this will be a manned rocket, a rocket that actually um, takes on astronauts. So we'll create a new file, a Swift file, and we'll call this one manned rocket. And we'll go ahead and put it in the same place. And now we're going to inherit or subclass our rocket base class. So now I can say class manned rocket and it's going to extend the rocket base class. And I'm going to add a couple of properties. I'll have astronaut1 and that's going to be of type string as well as a second one. All right, having done that, now I need to implement what we call a designated initializer. An initializer that takes all of the parameters needed to create this particular class as well as any of the values that its base class needs. So that base class does need that fuel parameter. So in addition to these astronauts, the designated initializer is also going to take that parameter for the base class. So we'll define that as follows. We'll say init and it's going to take a parameter called fuel which is typed to int and astronaut 1 which is typed to string and astronaut 2 which is also typed to string. And the second one, let's just say we want to make this one optional so the user may or may not provide it. And so we're going to do that by literally calling, making it an optional here. And that means I also need to do the same thing to the actual um, property. I'll set that as optional as well. And then we can go ahead and put the body on our initializer. And we'll say self.astronaut1 is equal to astronaut1 and self.astronaut2 uh, is equal to astronaut2. And then finally, in order to invoke the constructor or to make this the designated initializer, I'm going to call the superclass initializer and pass in the fuel reference here. So this is an example of a designated initializer. But sometimes I might want to create a manned rocket ship where I only have one rocket and not two. And so I could add a convenience initializer. So we'll say convenience, and that's a keyword, init, and we'll pass in the fuel, which is of type int, and just an astronaut one, which is of type string. And this one, these convenience initializers turn around and delegate back the initialization to the designated initializer. So I'll say self.init and I'll pass in the fuel as well as astronaut1. As well as astronaut2 being hardwired to the value of nil since I don't have one here. All right, so that's all there is to that. Now, um, 
The last thing I'm going to do here is just override that programmable blast off. So to override a method, I need to use the keyword override. Um, and in this one, I'm simply going to call the code that I'm passed. and add some additional code. And we'll check this optional if it has a value. So if it's not equal to nil, then we'll go ahead and print for that one as well. So there is a concrete class that we've extended from our rocket base class. And now the last thing I want to do here is to create one of these rockets in my main program and invoke its methods. So I'll go back down here and I'll say that I've got a fancy rocket of, and, and I can type it to rocket, that's actually valid but I'm going to give it a manned rocket reference. And I'll send in some fuel. And I'll give it an astronaut one of Sally. And uh, that's going to call the convenience initializer. So then we can call the method and we'll give it the same um, instructions we did up here. So we'll give it this expression right here. Okay, and now at this point, if we run this, Oops. We got a problem. Oh, we've got to explicitly unwrap because we passed a optional here and it expects a string. So now if we run we get Sally is now in space, so that worked. And if we wanted to call the full designate, uh, the full uh, initializer here, I could put in and then when we run it, now both Sally and Billy are in space. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can create classes, how you can have inheritance relationships among them, and how you can use protocols to define commonality among multiple classes, as well as to create closures and pass them as arguments to methods. In our next lecture, we're going to start digging into iOS itself and show you how we can use Swift to start creating iOS applications.